DDR, so what is it? It's basically multiple static images acquired at either um, six or 15 frames per second. It's a length of time of approximately eight to 10 seconds with an average dosage only about 1.3 times greater than the standard X-ray. I think that's important to realize, I mean, it's much less than a chest X-ray, much, much less than a shoulder or CT. And thus it's, it's something that, uh, at least from a patient standpoint, it really doesn't pose much extra risk. It's multifunctional. Um, you can you can utilize it in multiple different joints, um, but more importantly, at least from my interest, it's the upper extremity that I care about. I'm an upper extremity surgeon. I operate from the shoulder to fingertip, really specialize in certain complex pathologies. And this dynamic DDR has really helped us to reevaluate a lot of these pathologies. Um, one of my more interesting um, aspects that we've worked a lot on has been the shoulder. And as many of you know who treat shoulder pathology, it's very difficult to assess scapular humeral rhythm and the interplay between the glenohumeral joint and the scapular thoracic joint. So here, modifying this to be more of a 3D type motion, we started to look into how to actually capture this, how to capture it from an axial view or from a Gracie view. And this idea of the scapular humeral rhythm analysis is really um, kind of the novel things that we brought forth. And it's interesting enough, so E.A. Cobman in 1934 introduced us this concept of scapular humeral rhythm in one of the first orthopedic textbooks ever published. Yet we sort of have not been able to adequately or, or really uh, easily quantify this idea of scapular humeral rhythm outside of some very sophisticated laboratories with skin markers, a variety of other um, uh, imaging uh, modalities that most standard clinics aren't able to do on a regular basis. Using certain angles like the humeral angle, measuring between the humerus and, and a, a longitudinal line, the scapular angle and the thorax angle, we were able to start to quantify this idea of scapular humeral rhythm. And so you can see in these images, that you can see the glenohumeral joint, but you can also see the scapular thoracic joint. You can see how it's moving. You can see through the arc of motion how the, the, uh, the contribution of the glenohumeral and, thoracic, and the scapular thoracic joint sort of changes. We quantified this idea of scapular humeral rhythm based off of Cobman's initial equation. So this was an equation came up in 1934. We didn't have any actually ability to images. They didn't even have x-rays at that point. Um, but scapular humeral rhythm, looking at glenohumeral humeral motion over, over scapular thoracic motion. And we've, we've sort of started quantifying this in multiple settings. One of the first ones was adhesive capsulitis. And this is one of the first manuscripts that we are coming out with this stuff. Um, but as you know, adhesive capsulitis is in general and a clinical diagnosis. Um, MRIs don't have reliable findings for it. Um, and, and plain x-rays don't have reliable findings for it. So in, in, in general, when you have a frozen shoulder, you, you get diagnosed by it by an a expert, a sports medicine or a shoulder expert in the clinic. Um, using this scapular humeral rhythm measurements, we were able to compare 16 patients with adhesive capsulitis on the right compared to 32 patients matched for age and um, BMI on the left. You can see, just looking at the x-rays, there's an obvious difference in how the glenohumeral motion joint motion uh, moves as well as the scapular humeral motion. You can see how much they compensate when you have that frozen shoulder. Um, you can see that we matched it for age, BMI, and, and sex. And when you looked at those that had normal controls versus those that had adhesive capsulitis, the scapular humeral rhythm was, was almost triple those of normal controls, which means that the glenohumeral motion is much higher in those with normal controls compared to those with adhesive capsulitis. Kind of makes sense, but this is the first time we've actually been able to, uh, to actually quantify this in adhesive capsulitis and potentially give us some sort of objective measurement to diagnose this, this pathology. Um, this shows in the first 30 degrees, second 30 degrees, and final 30 degrees, how normal controls have a, a much higher scapular humeral rhythm, so much higher glenohumeral humeral motion compared to scapular thoracic motion compared to their normal controls. And I think these are kind of some cool graphs that um, John's uh, intern was able to sort of put together over the summer, but you can see with the normal controls, the relatively sharp angle of the glenohumeral joint coming back, uh, both in abduction and, and adduction, compared to the scapular thoracic joint, compared to a very flat glenohumeral angle in the adhesive capsulitis patient, compared to a much steeper uh, motion of, of their scapular thoracic joint, just showing that they compensate with their scapula, as many of us assume, but nobody's ever really quantified. You can look at massive rotator cuff tears, another uh, easy case use. So here, you can see in this patient, you can see not only subluxation of the humeral head, but once again, when you look at the glenohumeral joint 
um, compared to the scapular thoracic motion of the normal controls, the glenohumeral um, uh, angle was, was, was basically very minimal motion compared to a, a very dramatic scapular thoracic compensation. This is another patient that shows, once again, a very flat glenohumeral angle compared to a, a dramatic increase in their scapular humeral motion. So how much of these patients are compensating and how they can trick you that they actually think that they, you have more motion than they actually do, well, they don't really. It's really their scapula that's giving them this motion. Um, shoulder arthroplasty is another interesting one. So you're talking about reverse shoulder arthroplasty. We all know that, uh, that many of these patients don't get back to completely normal motion. But, but why is that? Well, it's because their glenohumeral joints don't necessarily get back to what a normal shoulder's glenohumeral joint looks like. And interesting enough, similar to some of the other, other instances I showed you, their scapular thoracic joint, so the scapular humeral rhythm is, is similar. And the reason why it is is because their scapular thoracic joint actually, actually compensates a little bit more. So we're getting a little bit more insight into what happens after a reverse shoulder arthroplasty. Reverse refracture has a very similar type of curve. So once again, look at that normal con control compared to the, uh, the patient that had a reverse refracture showing once again, you have some glenohumeral motion that's been restored, but not, not a ton. And, and the scapular thoracic motion is really what's giving them a lot of their motion. And then the diagnosis of a failed shoulder arthroplasty is also very powerful. As you can see in this example, it's pretty obvious why this patient failed. You have a cuff tear failure, their patient's subluxing up, and you can see how limited their actual glenohumeral motion is compared to their compensatory scapular thoracic motion. So these are all sort of some examples of, of pathology that's pretty easy to apply this technology and has really improved my, my ability as somebody who likes to take care of complex pathologies in, in, the, in and around the shoulder to really understand what's going on and understand when I treat them, what's going on after I treat them. But I wanna give you a couple case examples too that's been um, kind of eye-opening and, and, and very interesting to say the least. So I kind of showed you that massive cuff tear. Um, I think it's kind of cool to see how the, the head shifts up as we kind of all assumed in these patients that have rotator cuff arthropathy. Um, but even more so, let's say you have a, a patient that you do a reverse on. And so you have this massive cuff tear, you do a reverse, it looks pretty good from, from my standpoint, but um, ultimately it's nice to know what's going on inside that reverse. So how, it, how much is their glenohumeral joint actually moving? Um, how much is their scapular thoracic joint moving? How are they actually rotating? What's happening with the implant? Is there impingement on their chromium? Is there impingement inferiorly in adduction? Also, maybe you want to look at how your patient is doing after an arthroscopic lower trapezius transfer. So you had that massive cuff tear. You saw the superior subluxation. You can see with this lower trapezius transfer, we were able to pull the head back down, and now it almost looks like a normal shoulder, both with regards to rotation in and around, as well as with regards to abduction. So you can see you've been able to recenter the humeral head um, both on the axillary plane and on the Gracie view. And you can see we, we've, we've almost reestablished a normal shoulder with this procedure. Scapular pathology is even one of the more interesting aspects and one of the things that I, I think is, 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 is fascinating with this technology. So when you look at this, you can actually see how the scapula moves. And the normal shoulder on the, on the left, you can see that the scapula externally rotates, as we all know, around the body. Um, and contributes a fair amount to that overall shoulder motion. But on the left, I mean, on the right, you can see how there's very little scapular motion. And despite the patient having basically full glenohumeral motion, their scapula is in essence paralyzed. So this is a patient with serious anterior palsy. Here's another example, a 21 year old swimmer, limitation in shoulder function, no prior injury, collegiate swimmer, but very limited shoulder function. Um, he woke up one day and couldn't move his shoulder. No prior injury, nothing else really to explain this. Um, you can see his examination, he has scapular winging. This is the normal shoulder, so I'm testing the, the strength of his serratus anterior on the left. He has really good serratus anterior strength. See, so when we go to the right though, look at how much he wings out. So he has no actual serratus anterior function. So it means no ability to hold his scapula to his chest wall. Um, this markedly limits his ability to, to, to function, especially as, a, as an, a competitive athlete like a swimmer. And up until now, it's a clinical diagnosis. But as you could see, as you'll see in a second on his DDR, you can actually make this as a more objective thing. This is me stabilizing his scapula. And you can see I'm able to correct a lot of his glenohumeral motion by just, just uh, keeping his, his scapula against his chest wall. So here's his DDR. So you can see how limited his scapula actually is moving. So his glenohumeral joint almost has full motion, but he has very limited scapular thoracic motion. That's because the serratus anterior is not holding his scapula against his chest wall, and he doesn't have the normal external rotation that most of us would be accustomed to. You can see how much more information you get on the right compared to just a static image on the left, which looks like, at least from my perspective, a very normal shoulder. 
Here are two other patients, also with scapular pathology, both with serratus anterior pathologies, uh, paralysis as well. And once again, you can see how there is basically no scapular external rotation with either of these patients. Um, so it's very limited in how much they can actually use your scapula, and thus it's very limited how much they can actually use their shoulder. Shoulder instability is sort of the other, um, in addition to some of the ones I talked about, is the other one that I find very interesting, and uh, especially in some of these more complex patients, and what actually is going on within the shoulder. So there's a 22 year old gentleman, recurrent posterior shoulder instability, 100 plus dislocations, history of a seizure disorder, daily subluxations. And you can see how he is, I and he are actively, actively subluxing his shoulder in and out. So you can see I'm doing a posterior provocative maneuver and you can see his shoulder subluxing in and out of the joint here. His shoulder subjective is obviously very limited. Um, and you can see how limited he is in, in his overall function. So static x-rays, you can see um, AP or the gracie looks pretty normal. The scapula looks pretty normal. There is some, ab there is some uh, posterior decentering on the uh, axillary. And you can see on the CT scan, you can also see some posterior decentering. But I think when you see the, uh, the DDR, you can really get an understanding of what's going on. So you can legitimately see his shoulder sublux from in the glenohumeral joint and then out posteriorly back into the glenohumeral joint and back out posteriorly where that bony bank heart is. So you can see on these multiple views how he's, his, his joint is legitimately subluxing from inside the glenohumeral joint out posteriorly to where that uh, prior bony bank heart was from you know probably one of his one of his hundred plus dislocations. You can also see this on the Gracie how he subluxes posteriorly and kind of gets caught when he does internal and external rotation. Here's another example of a patient who had posterior uh, recurrent posterior shoulder instability, daily subluxations, very limited, had multiple prior surgeries. She did have some latissimus spasms, scapular dyskinesia. You can see she subluxed posteriorly. She has glenoid retroversion. In essence, a pretty complex patient who was sent to me for a posterior wedge osteotomy in a 16-year-old, mind you. Because of her latissimus spasm, and this is not the purpose of this talk, but um, because of her latissimus spasm and her scapular dyskinesia, we did a latissimus transfer to her greater curiosity and a pec minor release, and you're able to see, we were able to recenter the, her humeral head and gave her pretty good overall function. Um, unfortunately, on the right side, the same problem started happening, and she had basically the same imaging on the right side. So posterior decentering, this uh, this example of of, of, of um, not being able to uh, move her shoulder. And the cool thing was we got the DDR on the left versus right. So the left is the side we operate on, did the latissimus transfer, and we, you see you can see how we were able to recenter her head. On the right, you can see how she's posteriorly decentered, and she's posteriorly subluxed, and she's not able to move her shoulder because she's not actually in the glenohumeral joint. Anterior shoulder instability is also kind of an interesting one. There's a couple case examples for this. Um, I like this one just because it shows what happens after you treat these patients. So this patient had recurrent anterior shoulder instability, three prior surgeries, daily subluxations. Um, and as you can see here, she has a irreparable uh, subscapularis tear and she has pretty significant anterior glenoid bone loss. So we did a distal tibia allograft to reconstruct that bone loss and we did a latissimus dorsi transfer with an anterior capsule reconstruction to uh, rebuild that irreparable latissimus transfer. You can see our post-op x-rays looks pretty good. Um, Post-operatively, she was able to get back to fairly good motion. Um, she was able to return back to her work as a collegiate volleyball ref. Um, basically very limited limit very little limitations the cool thing about the DDR is you can actually see what's going on how she actually stayed inside the joint and she's actually centered over that distal tibia allograft you can see in the upper right um, on the axial view it also kind of shows how like legitimately what we did is we didn't necessarily recenter uh, that well it, it we what we did is we created a bigger surface area for her to uh, to now function on a bigger platform so in conclusion the reason why I like this technology and the reason why I get quite excited when uh, thinking about its future is it, it, it really gives you some cool insight into what's going on besides what you sort of kind of try to interpret based off some static views. Um, it's like looking at a picture versus looking at a video. It's so you get so much more information from a video. They say, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, but a video is worth a thousand pictures. I mean, you get so much more off these videos. Um, and as EA Cobman 100 years ago started talking to us, at least about the shoulder, it just shows, you know, how slowly we've adapted some of these ideas of these giants that came before us. But I mean, at least in the shoulder, I think it has some really cool potential. Um, I'm excited about it. And one of the other cool things is I've actually started bringing my laptop around my, my clinics. Um, just so I can show the patients their DDR x-rays because they get really excited about it. They think that I'm doing something novel that nobody else is doing, um, that somehow I'm more, I'm, uh, you know, 
more qualified or whatever because I'm doing these 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 dynamic images that actually get them some insight into what's going on in their shoulder. So thank you for your time. Please reach out to me if you have any questions via email or or via this uh, cell phone.